Good evening, everybody. My name is Marcus Fares. I'm founder and editor-in-chief of Design, the online architecture and design magazine. And welcome to this panel discussion called The Power of Design, kindly sponsored by Aratco. I mean, the power of design. Designers like to think that what they do changes the world. The, the power of design to change communities, the power of design to make your dining room look nicer, the power of design maybe to save planet Earth. It's a really big topic and it's a really um, contentious area. We have four people from the creative sector here who are all going to give their take on what the power of design is. So, Sana, first of all, over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm a concept developer and a creative director. I work with design and architecture. I have many different clients and I try to use design and architecture to add value to their brands or environments. Here on this picture, we see uh, lifts. And this is a company called Aritko and I work for them as a brand curator. And it's very interesting to see, look at their journey because uh, they produce lifts and they've done that for many years. It's quality products. But when they started to work with a designer, a Swedish designer, his name is Alexander Lervik, uh, they added on uh, design to the product. So it's not only a product, it's actually design. And how do you measure value in, in that sense? I mean, of course, in this case, it's easy because you just look at sales. They increased sales with 60% by adding design to a product. I was uh, designing or doing the design concept for the Spotify head headquarters in Stockholm. And uh, I don't know, I guess everyone knows what Spotify is. Yeah, so that's music, right? Um, when I was trying to find the red thread for designing their office, I was looking into their brand. And uh, of course, they produce music. But what does music do with us? Uh, it emphasizes moods and feelings within us. We decided to use their uh, themes. The, 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 all the playlists have names, and you all make your own playlists as well. And in a big building where it's 1,400 people working from 70 different nationalities, it's kind of hard to make everyone happy <laughs> with, with the looks of it. It's like being a DJ at a wedding, I would say. Uh, you can't please everyone. But in this case, I invited designers, really good designers, artists, illustrators, to work out of this theme. So they were uh, interpreting uh, the different names of, of the lists. I will talk about an experience that um, experience design uh, where uh, we try to make a space um, out of paper and this was for the Stockholm Furniture and Light Fair. We tried to make a space where we were not showing furnitures even if it was a furniture fair. We wanted to show uh, how emotions, how design actually uh, can make you feel uh, in different ways. And uh, one thing with this design was that uh, people thought that it was quiet in there. They got the sense of that it was quiet. And we measured the sound, the noise inside of the dome and it was actually the same out in the hall, like it is here, you can hear people talk. Uh, but the eye tricked the ear and thought that, you know, it's quiet in here. Uh, and I think that's pretty powerful. That's power of design for me. So you, Sana, you like a consultant, you work with brands ah, and you, you introduce yeah. them to designers, so you have to, Part of your job must be to convince the brands that they need design. So how yeah. do you explain to them 
the power of design. You mentioned that um, sales increased 60% when you worked with Aritco. Mm, yeah. So is that something you go in and you say to them, you need to work with designers because the power of design is more sales? Is that, is that your pitch? No, no, it's not. It, no, not really. Uh, I think that uh, to, to add on design also change the mindset of a company. You know, that um, for Aritko working with Alexander, it was not only that he added design to a product, they actually developed as a company uh, through design, through the design process. But no, I don't, really, I don't really sell in that way, but I'm a very good salesperson. Yeah, for sure. So you don't promise <laughs> percentage increases? Never promise anything like that. Fernando, please do your presentation. I started off making sculpture about uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and then about six years ago, I started making furniture. In about 2015 and 16, I took a trip, a very important trip to Patagonia in Argentina. And I got really inspired there by the glaciers and just some of the things that were going on in nature there. I was like becoming very aware of the idea of, of climate change in that, at that time. And so I thought, you know, I wanna start bringing some of that to furniture and bringing that indoors and sort of letting people know that there's, you know, issues around climate change and maybe have that be part of my work that when you're like sitting with a table, that that gets expressed in some way. And so there I am standing next to Perito Moreno, which is the largest glacier in Argentina. And one of the powerful things was that it was starting to melt. And so I thought, well, I came back to New York and I decided I wanted to make a collection of, of design pieces talking about that. And so you see here, I made this piece here, which is a sofa, and I hand carved the sofa, and then we, we cast the piece out of sand. So layer by layer, to get that color, to achieve that finish, and so materials become like a way for me to express metaphor. What I've been doing is I've been traveling, ever since 2015, I've been traveling to different parts of the world to find inspiration in nature and find a way to record our time. We're living in kind of a detrimental time when it comes to nature, right? Things, we may lose certain things. We may lose these glaciers. We may lose some of our mountains. We may lose things based on our behavior. And as an artist, I kind of feel like I want to record this time. It feels like the most powerful message that I could that I could talk about in my work. And so like we were talking about the power of design and for me, it's storytelling. You know, like as a designer, I'm not really trying to solve a problem. I'm not trying to say, oh, like how can we, you know, function better in a space, but it's more about telling a story. And that's powerful, especially if you can find a way to tell a story through an object. You don't really think about that too much. When you think about design, you don't think, well, how, how is this? coffee table telling a story. So this piece here is from a photograph I took in Switzerland and I translated into a coffee table. And so you see the mountains and uh, the mountain is made of sand and then the, the top part is made of, of glass. It's crushed glass. So we take like Coca-Cola bottles and they get crushed down into a powder and then I'm able to use these materials and we combine them with a resin and so we pack them into a mold. And we don't see what we're doing, we're actually just packing, kind of like when you're a kid and you would pour sand into those sand bottles, right? Little by little. So th this is kind of how the work is, is, is designed. For me, that's the way I can tell a story through my work. That seems to be the most powerful message that I can, that I can communicate. Thanks, Fernando. So, so for you, the power of design is in storytelling and you said you're not trying to solve a problem. But isn't the job of design to solve problems? And isn't, isn't what you're talking about maybe what most people would call art, which is to, to make people think about things? Yeah, I think that it's changing. You know, I use design as a vehicle to tell my story. Like, I don't care. Like, I, can tell a, I can tell a story through a chair. 
it doesn't really matter. Like, it's about, uh, it's not about solving a problem at all. I mean, in fact, it's like, it's just a vehicle. That's all. Design for me is just the vehicle. I mean, you have to remember, I started as a sculptor. So for me, I really approach design from an artistic point of view. I'm really trying to push a concept through a coffee table. You know, right? I mean, like the end object doesn't really matter. If it's, if it's functional or non-functional, it's kind of irrelevant. It's really just, you know, what is the message that you're saying through that coffee table? Okay, thanks very much. Lena, over to you. I'm based in Paris. I'm born in Beirut, and it's been uh, like almost uh, since 2006 that I have my practice. And we're doing architecture, bridging between urban design into product design as well. And uh, this is the project that I started my practice with, and it's a bit like the uh, opposite of uh, what you would start a practice with as an architect. So it's like a huge museum, like 40,000 square meters in Estonia in counterpart to the desert that we see around us. It's totally in the snow. So, and I started with this project. It's mainly about design and power because this is the Estonian National Museum and it's all about their history. There's like a large military airfield that is just at the edge of this building. And uh, the whole project, uh, my proposal was to come and appropriate this airfield and transform the history of Estonia. So in the beginning, when I won this competition, there was a lot of uh, oppositions against this project because there is the Russian airfield, there's the Soviet times, and it's the whole story about the memory of Estonia. How can we appropriate that? Can we keep the airfield? How does the museum function in this way? And today it's built, it's really transformed their relationship with that history, becomes a place for like almost a cultural incubator where people come and, you know, practice and uh, produce identity. So identity is never fixed, it's always moving and changing. Another project, this is in my hometown in Beirut. And as you know, maybe most of you are following the news at the moment. Uh, Beirut has lived the war for many destinies. I lived it myself. And uh, it has shaped really my memory of Beirut. And today we are really manifesting against that history and trying to build another memory for, uh, for the city. And that building, it's a residential building, and it really takes off from the memory of Beirut, from this kind of war-torn uh, like envelopes that we see, and changing that memory into a positive one. So it's an apartment building. Here you see the, north, uh, the south facade, so this is not like the main facade. And one of the things about this uh, project is that it's all a uh, handmade facade. So it's really introducing the craft into the building and trying to bring back the power of the hand in a way maybe to bring emotion into architecture because people just walk by and they want to touch it, they want to really um, like appropriate a building on, a, on the architectural scale. So it has an, a little bit like an emotional feel to it. So it becomes much more um, uh, sensitive in the city and deals with the memory of the city. On another scale, so this is like uh, the a restaurant uh, in Palais Tokyo, which is the center of contemporary art in uh, Paris. And here it's all also about sustainability. So it's a restaurant that is built all with uh, sustainable material, like the bar that you see on the right is all built with earth. So earth is the origin of agriculture. So by building with earth also you remind people of what you're eating, that it's coming from earth actually, it's very important to keep earth uh, living and through design you are able to impact and make a change. And also creating like an intimate relation in that space with the lighting and how it orchestrates the whole environment. So along that same line of ecology is this building in Paris, which is built totally in wood and it's about sustainable material. When we use wood, it stocks carbon, so it's very important to use sustainable materials, and then you reduce the impact of carbon in the environment. And it's all about also sustainable feeding and how to orchestrate a whole program about raising awareness, how we eat tomorrow, that we should eat sustainable, we should eat from 
the, the land that is planted just next door, not eat uh, pineapples when it's uh, winter time in a different country. Thanks, Lena. And what do you believe is the power of, of, the, of, of architecture in, in your case? I mean, a client could not work with a good architect, could just work with a, a value engineer, stick up a building that has all the, the, the letable space, the square feet that makes the money. We see it not just in Dubai, we see it in every city in the world. So how do you convince a client that you can bring some power and value to a project that they wouldn't get without you? Well, I think it's a question uh, of profit also. It's also a sense of what is profit today? We live in a society where profit is uh, linked to capital. And I think there, are, there is more than that. Of course, profit comes from, uh, in a way, uh, like first the added value that you give. We are human beings. We have to live in sustainable environments. We have to, you know, we have to be happy as well. We look for beauty. We look for, you know, this is like, this is priceless. You want to live an experience. It's not only about what you own, really. So it's first an awareness of what is profit. And second, of course, when you're adding a value, people want to be in these places. And then it creates like automatically an added value, which just uh, translates in a way financially. But that's not, uh, I mean, for me, I'm like trying always to like to resist and to struggle against what are the systems that produce our designs and our architecture today and how to change this value system in a certain way and to make people, you know, like, uh, because we, we have to do that to transform it, to be able to live in a more sustainable way tomorrow. Great, thanks very much. Ashish, over to you now. Actually, my story is kind of opposite of Fernando because I started as an architect, but I'm moving more towards art. This is what I call as a Jaipur totem. Um, let me start with the idea of India, um, which is a very dichotomic state where it lives between the villages and the urban environment. Um, I live in Mumbai, which is a very urban um, space, but uh, I travel to the villages. And two years ago, um, we started designing with these drawings to create objects, um, objects that could be functional at the same time non-functional or dysfunctional, um, but at the same time could have the idea of function almost like what Fernando, um, uh, Fernando's work resonates with. Um, when we started designing these pieces, the second stage was to manufacture. And when we started thinking of manufacturing, we were like, we should start looking within ourselves and within the country and start going back to the villages. So we did this entire tour of going through the country and working with 11 villages. Um, and the way we wanted to do it is to give them um, a monthly income and give them a way to which to give them power um, so that they don't leave the craft and go towards the cities to, um, you know, to take jobs that are almost coffee boys or, pib or runners. And what, what happens because of that is we lose craftsmanship through generations. So we started to arrest that at that space and we started to create objects like these um, within their environment without displacing them. Uh, what this is, it's a very simple form of the same lingam that repeats itself and then when, you, when it kind of starts opening out into stools, um, you see the blue pottery that is famous in Jaipur which is done with indigo. Um, and we started to kind of see how that works as a hidden membrane within the Eve's Sky Blue kind of structure that you see that reveals itself. So the next slide is um, a very humble store in South Mumbai called Raw Mango, um, which we wanted to create an environment of what is minimalism in rural India. Again, trying to see how we can bring um, rural India in its purest form made but maybe the Gandhian voice, um, but keep it extremely craft-based. Um, so what we did is we stripped off the space of all the, uh, all the unnecessary embellishments and the materials and kept it extremely simple and started working with uh, materials like metal work that's done on wood for generations in, in Rajasthan, uh, which is just like sheets of brass that are beaten on to create this beautiful uh, vessels 
and that was what you see as a, as a center centerpiece there. And again, when we were working with Raw Mango, which is a brand which works with Indian textiles and saris, we, uh, it reminded me of Ahmedabad again, where, which is my birthplace, where when we used to go with our parents to my mother to buy saris, uh, the retail experience was to sit in someone's house on a bed uh, on the floor, and they would open wardrobes and bring it out from there. There were no mannequins, there was no display, and that's what we wanted to do here. So we created a very special fabric uh, behind the shutters, which is mix of khadi and silk, and hand-woven and hand-spun, to create these kind of membranes that open out when the, when, the, when, when, the, when, the, when, when the buyer and the shopper comes, and then they can be sitting on those benches down there and just experience one uh, garment after the other. So it was a whole overall experience that we created. And then the, there's a last slide, which is, uh, which is these urban homes that we do, where we curate pieces from um, all over the world and contemporary art from India and the world to create homes that kind of speak about today and actually tomorrow. And yesterday as well, because a lot of uh, the, the kind of the history and tradition of India is, is really embedded in your work. And I think often, I mean, from, from my perspective as a journalist who writes about design, we're always looking for new things and new solutions and um, things that are about the future. But for you, do you think the power of design is t also has a role in preservation, in, in keeping things as they were, in keeping people, in, you talked about peeping, keeping people in villages and giving them an income. Marcus, actually, it's very interesting uh, here to break you here because uh, if you come to India and if you want to buy a piece of craft, um, you'll have to go to the airport and buy a keychain. You know, it's really sad. Like, the crafts in India is never brought into contemporary homes. Um, so we wanted to kind of change that perspective and look at it not as luxury, but something that you would appreciate with a story. You know, as something that has um, relevance because it's, it's a skill that has been honed for generations. So we w I wanted to break that philosophy. And we have a very interesting range of cultural backgrounds on the stage. We have Sweden, we have um, New York, we have Beirut to Paris, and we have India. I want to ask all of you the same question, but starting with you, Ashish. We talk about the power of design, but how is the power of design perceived in all of those places? If you were to ask an average, educated Indian person what is design and how powerful it is, what would they say? I think India, um, I, I think we are a very young country, first of all, compared to France and America. I think we're, we're just about 76 years old as a country. Um, so we've, we've missed a lot of the design revolution, unlike other countries in the West. Uh, India has just woken up to the design cultural revolution since the 2000s. Uh, yes, we had our 60s and 70s with Le Corbusier and, you know, uh, Pierre Jean Ray living, with, uh, Pierre, uh, living in, in our environment and creating uh, buildings and furniture. But I think now is the time where we are seeing new voices come up. And that's when we ask, uh, when you ask someone um, at a party about design, there is very little conversation. Um, I think everyone's first reaction is, I'm building my house, I'm going to Milan this year. And which is kind of very, um, for me, I find that extremely generic, um, but that's the honest truth. I want to jump on that a bit because I think also the, the issue is how, uh, what, how do we identify with modernity and how civilizations and our current society uh, like identify with modernity. In a way, it's the, the quest for this kind of international designs that everything that was related to craft and with history was regarded as ancient. So you would want to have a tower because it's becoming like it's more identified with modernity and with your quest for the future and today we're like witnessing a complete uh, you know come back into the roots into the identity into the importance of craft because we're fed up with this uh, kind of generic designs and everything is too abstract you don't see the hand it's not anymore human human so yeah I mean it's uh, I, and I think I see that even um, I think see that even the art world somehow you know I think the art world's moving back to the canvas and, and you know, every time I kind of look at fairs, I personally see myself reacting to 
painterly quality even more right now. And uh, craft is, for India, it's actually a very, very, um, very important piece because um, I think we, we have that in our environment, but unhoned. So it's, it's the right time for people like us to kind of start looking at it and re bringing it to the future. Well, coming from New York, I mean, in a good way and a bad way, New York is such a, it's a capitalist society there. So design, I feel, if I were to ask an average person in New York about design, I feel like it would reference back to value. I mean, essentially, that's, that's what we're seeing. You know, a lot of the interior designers there are really, are they're being hired to really bring value to, to these buildings that are, you know, $90 million penthouses. So I feel like a lot of the conversation in New York is about that. But within the community, I feel like we're, we're using that sort of capitalist drive, but to kind of insert ideas and, you know, our own, our own bits of power into it. But, but I would feel like that's, on an average person, uh, that's what they would essentially say, I feel. When you say in, in, the, in the condominium towers and that the uh, designers and architects are there to, to bring value, what you really mean is, is to generate extra profit, right? Precisely. <laughs> Given the problems in the world that we've alluded to, climate change and things like that, can design save the world? Can design stop climate change? Fernando, you said you didn't want to solve problems like climate change, but, but is it possible? Or is design really not powerful enough? It's, it's governments and corporations and, and uh, you know, protesters. It's a larger question than just design, really. It's like, if this is our field, I feel like we should, we should be doing something towards it. You know what I mean? Towards sustainability, towards talking about it in some way. It's not going to save the world, but all of us together in our fields doing that will lead to it. You know what I mean? So it's really about the accumulative effect of all of us being conscious of it and starting to change our own practice and starting to talk about it. I think that that, that together can have power, maybe not just me as an individual designer, because, yeah, my earth, whatever, might not have a global impact, but my, my studio can, and then your studio can, and your, you know what I mean? So all together we have... a. a it can have a huge impact in that way. So maybe I should rephrase the question, not can design solve these problems on its own, but what is the power of design? What is the leverage and, and how much influence can the community have? I mean, like for me, design is asking questions like and uh, setting, uh, like initiating new mindsets. So as soon as you're able to initiate a new way of thinking and a new mindset, a new way of producing things, you're able to influence a lot because you're able to, you know, to, to bring a different way of thinking and you, you're able to engage the community into that way and influence it also. Totally so agree. So it's like influencers, like you have like social media today, like this. Uh, so, so let's be real influencers in, uh, you know, physical life. I think for me, uh, from where I come from, the power of design is education because I think I don't know enough of design myself at this point to know the real problems that we need to solve, right? So first of all, to know what are the problems in the current environment that we stay in. Like where I come from, there are many problems that have, are being actually resolved and solved within the slum areas of Mumbai. Uh, we have a massive drive called the Dharavi Slum uh, Movement, where which is Asia's biggest slum. And there are lots of um, um, uh, recycling, upcycling, um, um, uh, you know, um, centers there, which we work with to create design products and to solve problems of toxication of water and things like that. Maybe one last thing about this power of design. It's uh, drawing to back to Beirut a bit because it's now a lot of revolution besides the political agenda that I don't want to tackle here. But it's very interesting to see how the people who are at the forefront of these revolutions are designers. They are really using their designs to convey messages, whether graphic designs or like art or like graffiti or like even product. It's becoming like a way, a language that uh, is almost universal, that is able to convey a message in a very strong way and to, uh, to disseminate it very quickly. So this is amazing actually to see how powerful we designers can be. Okay, I look, I think we're out of time. There's been a fascinating conversation. Thanks to our amazing panel for the conversation, and thanks to Aritco for sponsoring this talk. Thanks for coming. Thank you.